Well, hello, folks, and welcome. It's a real delight to uh, welcome you today to our event uh, sponsored by the Harvard University Native American Program. We are very pleased to host a panel today called Leaders in Education, Voices from Harvard's American Indian Program. Uh, my name is Joseph Gaughan, and I'm the faculty director of HUNAP. I'm also a professor of anthropology and of global health and social medicine here at Harvard University. I joined the faculty in 2018, and I'm an enrolled member of the Grovant tribe of Montana. Um, again, I'm really delighted that you're able to join us on this celebration of our 50th anniversary here at HUNAP. We've had a number of events this year. Um, this one is especially uh, exciting because it's going to feature some of our very earliest American Indian program uh, graduates. Um, let me start by acknowledging that Harvard University sits on the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and orient you a bit to the structure of our event. We'll start with a prayer, and then I'll introduce the moderator of today's panel. Um, and uh, that moderator will turn over to the founding director of the American Indian Program, who will talk for a bit. Then we'll hear from an alumni panel of former students who were here back in those years to talk about their time. And then, if possible, we'll have some uh, time for audience exchange at the end. I'm very grateful that we're recording this event in part because I regrettably have to step away after about an hour, but I'm very excited to see uh, all the way through the end once we circulate the link. So without further delay, let me introduce Wayne Newell. Wayne Newell is a Passamaquoddy language and culture educator, an educational activist, and a scholar of native tradition. He's a member of the first class of American Indian program students in 1970 to 71. And uh, Mr. Newell is going to offer a prayer for our event. Please, Wayne Newell. Let us uh, get into a prayerful mood. I would like to honor all of those people, alumni, who have passed, and also to honor all of the living uh, alumni of the Harvard American Indian Program. I will pray in my native language, and I'll briefly have a translation afterwards. Kjellowizid, Kjewalewan Apspemki Skok Mauniag, Lewan Apsna Kagyu Miliag Mautuagan, Gamaj Nulida Hazotibun, Eli Magwahatiag Bemki Skok Naga, Ebastat Kwak, Lidli Mikwi the Hartman. Kamaj Ankwaj Psigek Say Zigayu, Kwenugulit Pustu Yag, Naga Wulgakim Yam, Chu Atas Nizatunen. You'd get a Wedgi Artiag, Psigek Say Nundam Nen, Wedgis Wak Yag, Wigulti Yag. Nulam Sidmanen, Ananaga Nulas Weltmoti Banalian K. Ward. The epidem nook is an uskidam em nook, naganijan nook, nook mus nook, musum sun nook, nagap seal, a lagam who got mouse twin work. Come watch Nolly the Huns, a little one cave with none egmo. Pemkis cock, come watch shitpud, Pemkis cock and up, see the Nulla's wealth motiban, a little old yak Pemkis cock. Neolish. Briefly translating, Greater Creator, we are thankful, thankful. <laughs> we are thankful for today. We are thankful for the blessings that you offer us for this one day of living. We don't know what's ahead of us. We don't know. Um, we we do know what's behind us, and we are grateful for all of the blessings for that day. We're grateful for all the people who came to this institution, this place of learning. We take with us many lessons. We take with us hardships from leaving our families, some of us, and uh, we learn from those experiences. We are grateful for our families, our wives, our husbands, our children, our grandmothers and mothers, our uh, Muslim grandfathers and uh, our fathers. We are grateful for all the people that come in association with us. 
we honor all of the alumni who have passed into the spirit world. And we thank you for their lives, for them sharing all that they did while they were with us. We honor all of the other students who are part of the American program, American Indian program, and also all of the alumni, or rather all of the students of the Harvard University body. With all of these thanks, we give you praise and we ask that we please you for the day that you've given us because we don't know if tomorrow will be ours yet. And uh, we always close our prayers with knowledge, which means it is finished. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Newell, for that moving and respectful and proper prayer. Um, let me now please uh, turn the floor over to today's panel moderator. Kemiyawi Wapepa is Kickapoo and Sock and Fox. She's a 2009 Harvard College alumni, alumna, a middle school humanities teacher, and current PhD student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, studying culture, institutions, and society. So please, uh, Kemi, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Gunn, and thank you, Wayne, for that prayer. Uh, it's so nice to be here in community with you all today. Um, I'll first be introducing uh, Dr. Robert Mathai. He served as the founding director of the American Indian Program in 1970. Uh, after re responding to the US Office of Economic Opportunities invitation to start a graduate level training program for Native American educators at Harvard, he is now retired and preparing to write a brief history of the program. Dr. Mathai will speak about the origins of the American Indian program at Hugsey, recruitment of students in the first years, the goals of the program, and the program successes. And uh, a full biography can be found uh, at the link in the chat. So uh, Dr. Mathai, welcome. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here today, even virtually, uh, with many old friends and many new ones. Um, it was amazing and wonderful to learn that the American Indian program had morphed into HUNAP and was still functioning 50 years later, though in a slightly different form. What I would like to do is quickly give you some background because the American Indian program didn't come out of thin air. Uh, it, there were some events leading up to it uh, that all came together in a very fortunate way. In 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson was inaugurated for his first full term, having taken over um, moving from vice president to president after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And in Johnson's 64 inaugural address, he called for a, a nationwide war on poverty. This was a major change, a major emphasis building in part on what Kennedy had hoped to do, but taking it even further. To conduct the war on poverty, he and Congress created a new federal agency, the Office of Economic Opportunity, one of whose main goals was to address poverty of Indians on reservations and in big cities. A lot of people don't realize this, but uh, Native Americans, or as they were frequently referred to back then, uh, Indians were part of the original effort of the Office of Economic Opportunity. In fact, OEO, as it was called, had an Indian desk, that is an Indian office run by Jim Wilson, I believe a Sioux, uh, whom I got to know and appreciate very much because he did a lot to help not just Harvard at the Ed School, but a number of universities and higher education institutions around the country. And oh, let me digress one second about American Indian versus Native America versus whatever. Uh, I personally thought the program might want to be called the Native American program back in 1969 or 70, but for reasons I'm not entirely clear about, uh, OEO wanted it to be called the American Indian Program. So we went along with that and it was really a minor point of discussion, no, no real disagreement. 
in any case, uh, today I will slip back and forth between Indian, Native American, and, and who knows what else. In late 1969 or 70, Jim Wilson invited the Harvard Ed School to join a few other higher education institutions to recruit Indians, Native Americans, for graduate programs in education. And in April 1970, the American Indian program was funded by OEO and therefore came in into official existence. There were quite a few challenges in getting the program started. First of all, this was April of 1970 and we wanted to bring in a class of students or a group of graduate students in the fall of 1970 to begin their master's program or other studies. So um, anybody who's done any been recruited to go to college, you usually have a little more time to learn about, think whether you want to go and then sign up. And we, of course, were starting from scratch in recruitment in many ways. This, for those of you who are not quite as old as I am, and the, and the AIP graduates who are on the program today, this was in the days before internet. There was no Facebook, no Twitter, uh, no electronic means of communication. There were faxes, but they were really slow and, and very tedious to deal with. So in a few months, without the benefit of the internet or anything like it, we had to make student potential candidates around the country aware of the program, get them enough information to decide whether they wanted to apply, run them through the Harvard uh, screening process and admissions process, and then get them lined up with housing to come to Cambridge in the fall. Actually, uh, many of them came in the summer uh, for an, an introductory program. So recruitment was carried out partly because I had done um, a fair amount of work uh, with Native cultures uh, prior to coming to Harvard and had a, a little Rolodex of my own do you know what a Rolodex is? It's a thing, it's a, a physical thing that's a list, it's a group of cards on a wheel with names and addresses. Of course, this was again before uh, computers, personal computers were widely used. In any case, I had this little list of my own contacts. Jim Wilson at OEO generously uh, supplied the names of people he thought could help us recruit and spread the word about the program. And uh, oh, a couple of dozen of prominent uh, Indians around the country agreed to help us recruit and spread the word. So that challenging part of recruitment itself, the marketing, if you will, uh, got underway uh, as quickly as it could in the days before personal computers. Housing turned out to be a problem because anybody at Harvard then and now realizes that um, getting housing in dormitories or freestanding or rentals or whatever is quite a challenge in Cambridge. And here we were in April after uh, students had long since been admitted and were house hunting. And I went, I camped out on the doorstep of the Harvard housing office. Uh, they humored me, they were very polite and nice, uh, put up with my phone calls every day to make sure all of our students uh, had housing for when they arrived. And sure enough, that took place. Uh, one of our cha and other challenges was limited funding. OEO was spending millions and millions of dollars, but it was supporting uh, hundreds and hundreds of programs. So it, it could not write us a blank check. Originally, we had hoped to have uh, up to 20 graduate students. And based on the amount of money available from OEO, we ended up with uh, 11 in the first group and 11 or 12 in the second group. So all of these, ch all of these challenges were met and we ended up with a um, wonderful group of people, some of whom you'll see after I finish speaking. The initial program goals were to recruit a dozen or so, so Indians who could handle Harvard's challenging classes and could reasonably be expected to return to positions of leadership uh, on the reservation or in Indian schools and programs around the country. And we did that. 
we looked for tribal diversity. We didn't want everybody to be from one tribe or one region of the country. So among the 11 uh, students in the first group, um, we, had, we achieved this diversity and did the same in the second group. Uh, a major goal was to achieve 100% graduation rate on schedule. Uh, check that, we did it in year one and year two as well. We wanted to provide a supportive environment for students. So uh, our little staff of two, which ran the program at that time, uh, plus all the support staff that were so helpful in setting up and running the program at, within the Graduate School of Education, uh, tried to make the students feel as welcome as possible. Uh, we were given a, a house, Reed House, a historic house uh, on Harvard property that had just been relocated so they could build the new library. And here was this nice, wonderful space. And we needed space, promised uh, OEO that we would provide a gathering spot for the students and others. So uh, we took possession of Reed House uh, as an administrative office and a gathering place for the students in the program, in the AIP, the American Indian program. I think I'll let the, other, the graduates of the program say, whether they, so they enjoyed the uh, experience and whether the environment as, was as supportive as we hoped it was. The, the next challenge, and it started within months, was to find funding for the second year of the program because OEO ran on a one-year funding cycle. And in order to pick up uh, on the next cycle, we immediately had to turn our attention to filling out reams of paperwork and working with uh, Harvard admissions and other personnel to get these voluminous pages put together and submitted to OEO for the second program, even as the first program was getting started. And we did succeed in getting the funding for the second year. Um, another goal was to recruit a second group of students, which was much easier for the second year because Many of the students, many of the potential candidates had learned about the first year and either uh, didn't apply or weren't able to apply, but were much easier to reach and recruit for the second period, uh, second round of uh, programs. So we felt fortunate that so much groundwork had been laid that made it much easier to recruit the second group. Another initial program goal was to recruit an Indian director. Um, I, I am not a Native American, though, after the program got started, a lot of students and faculty came up and said, gee, Bob, we didn't know you were an Indian. I said, well, you're right, I'm not. And I was hired because I had, um, I was a, not only a graduate student, but I was an administrator at Harvard and did outreach programs, placed um, Harvard teaching students in internships on uh, Indian schools, had worked with a number of programs prior to being a graduate student that gave me um, experience with working with other cultural groups. So between knowing about the budgeting process and something about Native cultures, Native American cultures, uh, I was pretty much the only person available on the spot at the time to uh, run the program and get it started. But it was a condition of my employment on my part uh, that I would run the program for a year or so, but could immediately start thinking about recruiting an Indian director. And sure enough, one of the graduate students in the first year program, Bill Demert, decided to stay on to work for his doctorate. And he was a logical successor to me and uh, took over and ran the program from the second year uh, on forward from that. So I'd say we met our initial program goals. And I think uh, all of the students went back to work in uh, Indian education or Indian affairs at levels uh, in advance of what they had entered. So we felt that uh, all of the program goals for the university, for the ed school and for the students had been met. The other day, someone asked me what I thought when I looked back at the American Indian program. And 
personally, it was a privilege and a pleasure to know and work with all of these students for both the first and second years. I didn't run the program in the second year, but I recruited the second group. And I also had the pleasure of working with all these other Native American groups across the country in recruiting and promoting the program. So it expanded my knowledge and my contacts um, in a very positive way. On the other hand, of course, it was the students who made the program a success. They did the heavy lifting, they took the coursework, they uh, were away from home for a year or so, and um, they made it work. So it is a privilege, privilege to have worked with and known all of these good folks. And the cherry on the, on the ice cream soda was, I was delighted to learn that the American Indian program had over a period of years morphed into the Harvard University Native American program, QNAP, I believe you call it, and that the program is go, still going 50 years later, although in a, a somewhat different form. So these are the things that come to mind. Uh, and I'm delighted to hear that there are more Native American students at the university, because back when the American Indian program got started, the main cluster was at the ed school, 11 students. And there were you know, between six and 12 graduate and undergraduate students in all of the schools and Harvard College at that time. So we almost are, or pretty much doubled the number of Native American students on campus with that one program. Now, could somebody give me a, a time check? One minute. Wow, I, I didn't really practice this. Of course I did. Uh, there are many other things that, that weren't discussion, but I think the most important is uh, coming and going, it was the students. They came, they learned, they did a lot of good things on campus, they went home and did more good things. Uh, so they're the ones who deserve the credit and the appreciation. And again, thank you so much for letting me be part of the program today. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Mata. I, I know as someone who, um, you know, HUNAP has been a central part of my experience at Harvard, both as an undergraduate and a graduate student. Uh, you know, I'm grateful for all the work you put in to uh, create the predecessor to this program. Um, so with that, we're going to transition over to a panel of uh, alumni from the program. Um, I have several questions. Um, I will start by introducing Juicing each of the panelists, um, and then I will uh, go through in the same order to ask them the questions. And uh, at the end, they'll have a chance to share any um, advice or wisdom with us before we wrap up. Um, so we have four wonderful panelists today. Uh, the first is Della Warrior, who is Oto, Missouri, and the executive director of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Our second panelist today is Daniel Honani. He is a retired Hopi consultant and educator with years of leadership service to the Hopi tribe and nationally. Our third panelist you've already heard from today is Wayne Newell, a Passamaquoddy language and culture ed educator, educational activist and scholar of native traditions. And finally, we have Dr. Marie Batiste, a Mi'kmaq scholar, emerita professor from the University of Saskatchewan, an honorary officer of the Order of Canada, and a 2019 through 2023 fellow of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. Thank you all so much for being here. So my first question for you today is what originally brought you to the American Indian program at Harvard? We heard a little bit um, from Dr. Mathai's perspective about the recruitment and application process, but I'm curious what that experience was like for you all and, and why you were interested in coming here to Cambridge. Um, so Della, let's begin with you. Well, I'm really pleased that the program is still going on after all of these many, many years and for me, I, um, I didn't have any interest in going to Harvard. I was, lived in a small little um, rural community and um, pretty much a country girl. And um, I got an application. I had been running an upward bound program and uh, doing some community development work. And I got this application inviting me to apply. 
And I thought, Harvard? I wonder why they sent me this. I can't, you know, that's for your super smart people. And I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those brilliant people that can go to Harvard. I'm just an average person. So I threw it away. And um, a couple of weeks later, uh, I got a call. Or maybe got a, I don't know when I got a call from, uh, well, I got one call and then I got another application and I, just, I didn't throw it away. I just left it there and I didn't open it. But I remember Dr. Bill Sturdivant from the Smithsonian called me and he asked if I got the application. Did I know about the program? And I told him, yes, I, I, did. I received it. I said, but. You know, I'm not uh, one of those, I'm not uh, of the caliber of a person that can go to Harvard and be successful. I'm, you know, just have average intelligence, so uh, I, I'm not going to apply. And he said, well, you know, you really should uh, consider this. This is an opportunity for oh, you. No. And you're doing, you know, some really uh, great work. It's their end. So, um I um, I did apply, and I, I was accepted. So I was really uh, astonished. And in fact, I told it's my muted. grandfather good, that good. Um, I had applied and was accepted. And he knew more about Harvard than I did. And here he was, you know, like 70 years old. And he said, oh, granddaughter, that's wonderful. You'll be the first Oto, Missouri, that, you know, can go to this prestigious school and he said well you go on and when you graduate I'm going to put up the teepee for you and um but unfortunately we never got to do that because he passed away in April before I I graduated so that's uh how I got to to Harvard and at that time there weren't you know like now you have thousands of native students in uh, universities all across the country. But at, during our generation, we were, you know, there weren't that many in colleges and universities. I mean, we all knew each other on the campuses and who we were, and we tried to, tried to support each other. And, but now there's, you know, so many, many college students, and it's so wonderful to see that. But at the time, I think we're a fairly small group across the country, and um, I guess they must have kept, kept track of us because they would send us applications, and uh, I was told that they uh, encouraged those that had been active in their communities to uh, to apply for for this project, so they could uh, we could begin to see leadership in institutions. That are so that's um, my story of recruitment and how I uh, got to Harvard. I had I was a widow and I had two young uh, small daughters and uh, it was a challenge, but I, I went. Great, thank you so much, Della. Um, so we'll move on now to Daniel. Would you like to share with us uh, why you came to apply to the program? Um, that was half a century ago, when you look at it from that perspective, and it's been very difficult for me to fully remember whether I applied or not. And um, as I look back to my past, about that time, or maybe six months before, uh, I went to Harvard, I was already uh, established in the Cambridge uh, vicinity uh, in, in Boston, even though I lived out in Hull, Massachusetts. But to make a long story short, how this started out was that I was employed by my tribe as a accountant or a comptroller and uh, Commissioner Robert Bennett started a national group called National Indian Education 
advisory committee made up of chairmen of numerous tribes uh, in America. And my chairman was selected to be on that committee. His name was uh, Logan Gopi. He went to one meeting in Washington, DC, came back and said to me, whether you like it or not, from here on, you're going to be my replacement. And so from there on, I began to be involved with all these chairmen uh, from numerous tribes. There was about 19 of them. And I learned a lot from them. And one of the th projects they had was to contract with an outside firm to study the status of Indian education throughout America. And so they bid out the uh, program, the study, and apt associates, which had offices there in uh, Boston or Cambridge, won the award. Commissioner Bennett then apparently talked to the next chairman, whose name was Gene Fredericks. Gene came into my office at Hopi and said, I'm letting you go. I thought I'd done something wrong, but he said, I'm letting you go because you have an opportunity. Commissioner Bennett wants you to monitor the study that has been let out to this place in Cambridge to a company named Apt Associates. And um, I didn't argue with my elders that time. So I packed up my family. We had a hard time finding the apartment like um, uh, Bob men mentioned, it's hard to find anything. We lived with a, Englishman who was employed by Apt Associates for about three months before he found a place way out in Hull, Massachusetts, um, past Nantasket Beach. But it was a great experience for the four children that I already had. We lived right by the ocean. They learned an awful lot while they were there. One of them came home with a Bostonian accent that you couldn't believe and it was a novelty out here when we brought her back home. This opportunity to study Indian education throughout America brought me into contact with numerous doctoral uh, people with PhDs from Smith, Harvard, MIT, BU, and they taught me an awful lot. We went to probably no more than 22 different reservations throughout the nation, various tribes, and stayed out there a week at a time with all of these experts and talking while they did their thing. I talked about Indian education and their culture and their language and the sustaining of all of those. Well, part of that study later on became a part of a Senate committee report called Indian Education, a National Tragedy. I don't know how many of you have read that or not, but Apt Associate and some of our writings uh, were a major portion of that study. It was during that time when the Harvard program apparently was out recruiting and one of the fellows, uh, Dr. Um, Roop was his name, came in and said to me, and at this time we were um, uh, living in Brigham City, Utah to carry on the cultural curriculum development 
model development. We had just started the program. He came in and said, you have been selected to go to Harvard. And I says, how, how did I get there? And he says, well, you've got a lot of recommendations. And so there must have been at least six people at the national level who provided recommendations in my behalf, all the way from Commissioner uh, Robert Bennett to Louis Bruce to um, uh, Jim Wilson, uh, people of that type. And, but I never remembered ever actually filling out a form and applying formally. So for the life of me, I try to remember if I did or not, but I can't remember. So as I got there to Harvard, I was entrenched in my own culture. I grew up here in my village where I'm at now on Hopi. And I grew up to our religion. I grew up in our kivas. I listened to old people. And they gave us instructions on what to look forward to in life and that we were born with a destiny. And that destiny will manifest itself by how you feel about yourself. And so when I got to Harvard, there was a couple of concepts that really blew me out of my chair. First of it was, as we would meet together as a group sometimes in the, in the evening, um, I guess I was really talking about Hopi and Hopi being better than anybody else. So I, I became an ethnocentric SOB. That's what they called me in our little group. Later on, they talked about genocide and the genocide that occurred to tribes. And I said, you know, we never encountered that until much later than some of the other tribes. The only genocide that we ever experienced was from the Navajo tribe. And I remember being a writer of minutes for my village council made of 18 men. They're all gone now. And they would talk about what clan they came from, what it meant to us, how it related to our religion, how it related to our land, and how we got here. And how we're supposed to be the guardian of this land until the Navajo showed up. Now we're totally surrounded by the Navajo tribe. They talked about how Hopi pleaded with the federal government to get the Navajos to move. And they helped Kit Carson round up quite a few of them who were then later on sent to Fort Sumner for what we refer to nowadays as encroachment. Well, a treaty was signed between the federal government Navajo tribe that the Navajos would never again encroach on Hopi land. Well, you know what happened. Those were the fighting words that I grew up to and how I had this built inside of me to go and continue to learn, maybe not to correct what had happened in the past, but to find a way for my own people, the younger ones, to be able to have something to grow up to. And so I got involved in tribal government, education, and so forth. And the important thing about this whole thing to me was, one, I never left education. As I left Harvard, uh, a couple of years, I worked for uh, 
at the associates again for uh, project uh, necessities foundation, which was the continuation of our work. Then I went to the Southwest Cooperative Educational Laboratory for about a year. And then University of New Mexico picked me up as an associate professor to begin working with all of the 19 Pueblo Head Start teacher aides to get their credentialing. We trained over 300 of them throughout New Mexico. Then I left and went to College of Conado, a Navajo community college of all places, and became the president there for five years. Then I got associated back with my tribe as a tribal operations officer. I was the major link between the tribal chairman, the council, and the federal superintendent, all the way up to the area directors, all the way up to the Indian commissioner. So I was an in-between person that major lived on. And so then I worked for the Hopi tribe for many years. And during that time, I participated with Save the Children Federation on their board. For four years, I served as the Arizona uh, Indian Commission president for two years under Governor Symington and two years under Governor Moffat. And so as I continued to stay involved uh, in Indian education, I remembered my teaching from the old people saying, we have to show our young people a development of some form. And so when I left the Hopi tribe after I lost my son, it devastated me to such an extent that it almost ruined my life. But I came home to my village and I did consulting work. I went all over Alaska evaluating Title III programs, numerous reservations throughout the United States evaluating Title III programs. And then my village picked me up and said, we want you to revive a 1984 economic development corporation that we had developed, which is now defunct. Here's 25,000. Great, Dan, thank you so much. <laughs> so I started that in- I'm just gonna cut in here so we have okay. time to get to just our one other panelists. Okay. Uh, okay, very quickly, here is a, E uh, email address, experience Hopi, one word, experience Hopi at dot com. If you can tune into that, you will find some of the achievements that we have made out here on the Hopi Reservation. Beautiful travel center and a beautiful motel. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you anticipated actually my second question there, which uh, we'll, we'll get through as well. Um, so let's move on now to Wayne. Wayne, would you tell us what brought you to the program, please? This is my technician. You can't see him, but he's, uh, I'm very proud of him. He works in New York City with a big firm, but they told him to stay here at my sister's house until the epidemic was over. He'd been here for a few months. Anyway, my name is Wayne Newell. Bull good we you holding the manu jo Wayne do on the leeways no jo best demo cardig or the past mcquadi and uh i like to introduce myself because my language english is my second language i spoke nothing but past mcquadi until i went to the school and um i started noticing um, even at a young age, that our language was beginning to decline. People were, young children were talking more English than Passamaquoddy. In our house, you did nothing but. I have a very, I had a very militant grandmother. 
when you were at her house, she said, don't you speak any English in here. Then when I went to school, they said, don't you speak any native language in here. So there was that conflict. Uh, Marie's laughing because she probably knows what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, I was not a federally recognized Indian tribe at that time. We did not become federally recognized in the late 1970s when, of course, we had we were involved in the uh, lawsuit against the state and the federal government. But anyway, I was st state recognized. My background is that I went to two colleges and did not succeed very well. I uh, went from high school to Emerson College in Boston because I was interested in radio and television and I was interested in, in the broadcast industry. That was my, and still is my main interest, but the other main interest I have, of course, is the revival of our language, which actually is endangered still as much work as we have put into it, but we are making progress. So anyway, I went to Emerson. I did not do well because of cultural shock. I didn't know what to call it at that time, but my God, you go into a major city like Boston and uh, then you go into a dormitory and uh, students just, it's like I was invisible. It, it, I, I made very few friends. I did make a couple that, that I'm still friends with, but uh, in terms of the large student body, I, I, I just got very lonely. And so at the second semester, I just did so poorly, I left. But I did something really, really nice. I applied for a job at the Perkins School for the Blind, which is in Watertown, Massachusetts, very famous school. And I got to meet Helen Keller at that time once. Um, and it was, it was a pleasure uh, being with her because of her life story. I just, I just ate that all up and it just, it gave me so much enthusiasm and so much to my own self image that uh, it, it just being with her. So anyway, I worked there until um, June. I went back to my own community at uh, Zibayig. We call it Zibayig. It means by the edge of the water. And, um, I registered for a small college in Northern Maine called Ricker College. It was just a, it was a former Baptist college and they had a culture, uh, they had a record institute for high school and then you had the uh, BA degree program. Well, same thing happened. There was a lot of prejudice going on in Roostick County at that time open prejudice. The Indians got to live at the down dump, but nowhere else. And uh, it, it was just awful. Um, as soon as they found out I was, I was from a native tribe, I just got ostracized in a, in a big way. And it was hard to make friends. It was not, it was hard to meet a girlfriend even, you know. Um, so <laughs> again, I didn't do well. I lasted until the end of the second semester when I said this is not for me I began to realize that I wanted something something better than always running away from places that I was afraid of places that did um, some a lot of prejudice and it didn't do much for my self-esteem the other fact is that I, I couldn't see, I am legally blind, but I never let that get in my way. The only thing I really can't do is drive a car, at least <laughs> every now and then I threaten, every now and then I threaten and people leave the room, actually. <laughs> um, so I worked at different jobs and one of the things I was interested in is working with the youth of our community. When I say youth, I was barely, 24, 25 years old myself, so I wasn't all that old. Um, but I, I wanted to start a group because one of the things that I noticed about our community and even in our own family was a high rate of alcoholism. And uh, that didn't do much for self-esteem, believe me. 
and uh, there wasn't any programs to help people in rehabilitation and that kind of thing. The school program was disastrous. Danny Hanani talked about it a lot. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get included in that particular study because we were state recognized. And, and, and uh, there was a tendency on the part of the federal government to pretend that we didn't exist. And um, there were thousands of people in Maine who were uh, in, in, in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia who were um, invisible. I guess that's the word for it. But at least in Canada, there was some visibility of the Mi'kmaq, for example. They're the biggest tribe in, in maritime provinces. And uh, we had a lot of influence with them. We can understand part of their language, but not all of it. Um, and uh, the Maliseets, we can speak with them. We understand their dialect and they understand ours. The Penobscots, well, unfortunately, the Penobscots declined so bad that the last speaker died just a few years ago. And there's one that I'm real proud of because she's really working hard. Carol Dana is working hard to try to, in the effort to revive and the Penobscot Museum is working hard along those lines. And so the uh, Abenaki in Quebec, I give you all this history because my next, um, my, my next answer to your question is, Maine finally farmed the Department of Indian Affairs in the 60s. And they hired an Indian commission named Edward Hinckley. And he had a lot of experience in, in, with the Southern tribes. And I don't know, Dan, if you ever met Edward Hinckley or not, but he was a commissioner of Indian Affairs for Maine. And uh, um, he had some of the contacts that you were talking about a little while ago, Bob Bennett, was one of them, for example. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure about Bill Wilson, but um, he, and I worked with him on several of the programs that I was trying to start. And he was a very easy, very enthusiastic man to try to do something, to try to do something with the apathy of our community. So one day he came over and said, you know, Harvard's starting a new program. It's called the American Indian Program and they're recruiting. I said, Ed, don't even talk to me about that. I don't even have a bachelor's degree. <laughs> They'll never even talk to me. Well, he said, put on the application and in, you know, the, the long question that we had to answer as to why we wanted to go to Harvard. I stayed up all night and <clears throat> I get emotional when I think about this part. Open my heart to whatever needed to be written on that paper. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And fortunately, I married a wonderful woman who is also a wonderful secretary. She typed it up because I wrote it all in longhand and she's the only one that can read my writing. <laughs> anyway, she typed it up. I filled out the application, we sent it in, and I, it was sort of a joke almost, but Ed believed in the fact that I had a lot of life experience that I could share with the university, with the student body, but more importantly, a lot of experience that I could learn from. I needed a lot of learning. I needed to build my self-esteem more and more and more. And so all of a sudden, I get this um, uh, call or something, I think from Bob Mathai's office, excuse me, doc, Dr. Mathai's office, sorry, Bob. <laughs> I wanted to call you that just once during this uh, section. Anyway, and said that you are scheduled for an interview at such and such a time. I said, oh, gee, wait a minute. <laughs> What do I prepare for an interview? Well, you got to get a new suit. That, that's what I said to myself, so that you can impress these people that maybe they'll listen to you. So we went and bought a new suit. It was, it was a black suit. When I got it on, I looked like a friggin' undertaker. And so off I went to Harvard. And it was the night before they had closed down Harvard Square for the 
at that time there was a lot of protesting for because of the Vietnam the Vietnam conflict and um, so I went into the interview and I looked around the, the people and there they all were not dressed as undertakers some of them hadn't even shaved for quite a while and of course I don't really shave that much um, as I grow older I seem to shave a little bit more anyway there's Bob Mathai sitting there and he doesn't look like he's looking now. He had a lot of hair on him and he had a flannel shirt, if I remember correctly, and dungarees. I got dungarees on, but you can't see them, thank God. Um, anyway, we had a very pleasant discussion about I don't know what, but it seemed that I was able to answer the questions that they asked me about why I wanted to come to Harvard. Nobody really, if I remember correctly, brought up the fact that I didn't have a bachelor's degree. And I was kind of glad that they didn't. Um, so interview over. I'm feeling, um, I don't know what I'm feeling at that point. I'm saying, well, it was a good experience. That's, that's, I think that's the best I can summarize it. I waited and I can't remember how long time had passed but I got a letter asking me to matriculate. I didn't even know what matriculate meant. You know, don't forget, English is my second language. So I kind of asked around, I asked Ed. He said, well, it means you would like, they would like you to be a student there. I think that's what he said. And so I was surprised. I think that's the calmest way I can, I can tell you that I was surprised. And so. Oh, yeah, thank you so much, Wayne. I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna move on now, just keeping an eye on the time, but thank you for giving us a picture of what that you was got like. It. You got it. Yeah. Um, so Marie, I'm gonna move on to you and, and same question, what led you to apply to the program? I'm going to reorganize you a little bit because I know you don't have much time and I just want to re remind everyone that we now have, I think, probably 15 minutes left. Is that correct? Thank you. Okay, so with 15 minutes left, I, I, I'm going to take the question that you asked and then the questions I know you're going to ask and try to put them together and then let Della then finish up because I think that our, our, our you know, we, we intended as uh, to give two to three minutes for each question and, and that's not exactly how it's gone. So, um, but it does give, maybe Della will have a little time to, to, to uh, go to her uh, second question that perhaps uh, that we need to, to get to. Um, I, I, what I'd like to say is that the the era of the 70s, um, when I graduated was uh, from high school in 1971, was the era of the civil rights movement. It was the Vietnam War. It was um, the uh, American Indian movement. It was it was a renaissance of of the dispossessed. Um, at the time, it was, uh, we were called the disadvantaged. Um, and there were a lot of then programs that were helping thus the disadvantaged. I had just come out of, um, out of uh, high school and I joined um, the uh, University of Maine working in a program basic studies for disadvantaged youth. I knew Wayne Newell because I had had done my uh, teacher uh, internship on his reserve for a period of time, met him, was in the schools. Um, and he also uh, set in me a, a, a kind of an aspiration for the language. He was he was very much dedicated to that idea. And we had a lot of time to begin to talk about that and think about that. And so my work at, from there, from in working with Head Start in the bilingual bicultural program led me to going to Harvard because Wayne Newell brought me to Harvard. Uh, he talked to my parents and said, you know, you should get Marie to go and so on. And they told me and I go, yeah, right. But then I said, hey, if Wayne Newell can go and he can't, he can't see. And he basically, you know, has uh, 
uh, hasn't finished, you know, his with a graduate education. I said, I think I might be at least at par with Wayne Newell. I think I can do it if he can do it. And of course I went and doing it was like finding a way to get through the program. I had uh, a wonderful help with uh, the American Indian Program provided uh, tutors um, and, and other kinds of things uh, for helping us through things. So our gathering uh, in the Reed House and have, having that critical mass of students uh, to help each other. But it was at that time I also met my husband who was a, in the uh, Harvard Law Program and I needed a tutor in public school law. And uh, Susan Swan, who was the secretary then said, we can help provide that. And I said, find me somebody then. And she said, well, we've got a couple from the law school. I said, the most dependable, whoever is the most dependable, I'll take that one. So I've taken Mr. Dependable home. He is now my life partner and <laughs> <laughs> and we have uh, um, raised our families and so on. But I'm a professor here at the University of Saskatchewan and um, the, the Harvard program provided me with a background that got me into both teaching at uh, Berkeley. I taught at the Native American program at Berkeley as well as doing research in American Indian um, or the um, American Institutes for Research and Bilingual but Cultural Education. And so those all things combined got me also into Stanford University where I graduated with my doctorate degree eventually. And all of this has lended me to being uh, working in indigenous languages, indigenous knowledges, decolonizing education. And I'm now completing as an emeritus professor that work. That said, gives you a little snapshot of the whole thing. Back to you, Kimmy. Thank you, Dr. Batiste, and thank you for uh, so much information that you were able to cram into a short amount of time. Uh, Della, I'm going to come back to you now. The others have had a chance already to speak a little bit about how um, you know, their time at Harvard applied to the work they did later on. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that. Oh, you're on. there you go. Uh, OK, now, all right. I have to kind of back up and really talk about the Harvard experience before I talk about what I was able to, you know, what my career led to uh, and how it evolved. Um, I remember my first uh, class, I went to get the book list and the professor was going through the expectations and all of that. And I got the, the list and it was pages and pages and pages of the reading list. And I remember saying to one of the fellow students there, I said, does he expect us to read all of these books? And he said, yes, you know, you're at Harvard and you got, uh, Harvard thinks that they don't do anything wrong. I said, well, I don't think I could do all this. He said, hey, he said, Harvard doesn't make any mistakes. And if you got in, uh, then that may, means you're not gonna fail. So, um, you can't, you know, you can't make anything lower than a B and you, you know, you're Harvard, Harvard doesn't make mistakes. And uh, then I remember the, the attitude of the faculty. They treated us with respect. I mean, they treated us like whatever we said was profound. And I wasn't accustomed to that kind of attitude. And I can remember thinking, what if the teachers in all the elementary schools, well, all the schools, in the elementary schools treated all of their students like they were super smart? What kind of world would we have? And I, I just remember that. And then, you know, being there for that period of time, after all, you're all with all these elite intellectuals and it rubs off on you. So you think, you know, you're kind of smart too. So after you leave Harvard, you, you, it takes two or three years to kind of settle down to reality. But certainly Harvard has uh, opened many doors for me and uh, the, the learning that I, what I learned there and was taught, I've certainly put it to, to uh, good use. I've been a, um, well, my first job, I have to tell you this story because uh, when I got my job as the director of Albuquerque Public School, director of Indian education for Albuquerque Public Schools, 
uh, I wanted the job and I interviewed several candidates and they selected me. And then I was petrified. I called up Dan and said, Dan, I got this job. I don't now that I got the job, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and he says, Yeah, Dalla, just calm down. You know, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. And if you don't, uh, what was it he said? Um, um just pretend you know what you're doing. That's what everybody else does. <laughs> so anyway, I, that was my first big job. And, you know, I moved on, became a tribal chair, uh, college president. And I've been, you know, consultant. And uh, now I'm this in, in a, the museum world. So, you know, Harvard, uh, certainly, you know, people, when you, they say, oh, Harvard, they get all, you know, they expect good, great things of, of you. Um, so I think it gives you a lot of confidence and you work, I worked super hard, uh, harder than I ever did in uh, undergraduate school because of this whole attitude that Harvard, it permeates through the whole system. So, uh, it, you know, carried me and gave me the confidence to do the jobs that, to try for the jobs and then to to undertake all of those different jobs. And um, so that was my, um, you know, how Harvard has benefited me, uh, you know, in my, uh, in my career and my fellow students, you know, I want to just go through this third question just to catch up. We were all very close and we kept in close together uh, communication for several years. And then I think after, you know, about seven or eight years, it, we don't, you know, haven't kept in that much contact, but uh, it was a great experience to meet these students from other tribes that I had never heard of. And it was just really exciting and interesting. And then I'm gonna answer your last question here real quickly. Uh, my my thing was watching Harvard Square, watching, pe watching people go, uh, around walking on Harvard Square and watching people and um, interacting with my, my fellow students. And there was this uh, cowboy bar downtown. I think it was called Caravan East or something like that. Uh, we would go there a few times and uh, went out to Dr. Mathai's house uh, for a clam bake or crab bake or something like that. And uh, the other fun thing we did, I just kind of lost it here. Um, oh, I went to see James Brown. And that's always been a highlight. So um, I'm trying to make up time here. <laughs> like no, we're... that was great. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you giving us a snapshot of what it was like to be a student here. That's really wonderful. Um, so believe it or not, we are already coming up on time. So we're just gonna go around once more um, and this will be your chance to either, um, you know, respond to any of the questions that you didn't have a chance to respond to yet, uh, or this is your chance just to share some words of wisdom, some final advice uh, to everyone gathered here today before we head off. Um, so I'm actually gonna start with uh, Marie this time, Dr. Batiste. Well, thank you. Uh, and could you give us a time so we know what's the time? Is that like a two minute time? Yeah, we're aiming for like two minutes. Okay, two minutes it is. Okay, well, I, I would say that I had a wonderful time at, at the American Indian Program at Harvard. It wasn't necessarily a program as it was a cohort of people who came together. Um, it didn't have courses at the time that we had to take. It was, there was, there, you know, we had Will Antell as our instructor. I think that what we need to do is we need to make the American or the Harvard program more robust. Um, in, at the University of Saskatchewan, we have 50 indigenous um, scholars who are part of, the, part of the whole of the university. So when Harvard says we've got five, I think, really, you know, after all this time, really, you can only find five that you can bring in. So I, I'm thinking that, you know, 
that while there's a lot of great things going on, uh, bringing people to Harvard on the aspiration that you're going to just absolutely grow through whatever they give you um, doesn't take into account what we as indigenous people need today. We need a decolonized education. We need an education that's going to not only provide us the critical consciousness about where we've been and the generations before us have been, but we also need to recognize the strengths of our own indigenous knowledges, our own indigenous theory, our own indigenous methodologies, our own indigenous foundations. And as a basis for that, then we can begin to draw upon both the strengths of a Eurocentric Howard ha Harvard education, as well as an indigenous knowledge foundation. I don't think that it is relevant any longer for us to be given a colonial education based on non-Indigenous instructors telling us about the, the wonderful world in which we live. I think now is a time, and if it hasn't gone, you know, I haven't gone other places, that we need to really build a decolonized um, education and in, in places like in Canada, we are doing that kind of work. We are really building on reconciliation. We're building on the regeneration of indigenous peoples who will be, a, who will be strengthened by their indigenous languages, their connections to land, their connections to communities and their connections to their knowledge systems. That's what I think is needed at Harvard. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I know uh, you've inspired a lot of enthusiasm in me and also in the chat, so we really appreciate your words. Uh, Wayne, we're gonna come back to you. Just one to two minutes uh, for you to say your, your final piece here. Okay, I guess I'm on. <laughs> um, well, my experience at Harvard is, I talked about it a little bit. Uh, one thing that I, uh, Forgot to mention, I was listening to Bob's um, chronology, and one of the things he talked about was housing. We ended up on the 12th floor of these apartment houses, which, <laughs> which was kind of interesting. It was, it was an apartment, and, and it was really nice. I could walk to everything at, at Harvard uh, to attend classes. The other thing I wanted to mention was I got to teach one of the courses I think in the last semester about what I knew about uh, uh, reservation life, what I knew about, you, you know, some of the things that you talked about, Marie. I got to uh, um, talk about our, our court case with the United States government. And uh, it, it, was, it, it was really interesting to do that and have the theater full of students anxious to, to hear what I had to say, because one of the things that that I had always fought about was being invisible in my own state. And uh, when I got to the big city, same thing. I was over a lot of that and teaching the course was a good sign that my enthusiasm about self-esteem had, had grown a lot. And I got that experience uh, through my association with other tribal members in the, in the first 11 of us um, and um, also with people I knew like Marie and also another lady that I recruited, she become, became a doctor. All right, we'll, we'll come back to you in just a minute um, and get you unmuted um, while we're doing, oh. I'm back. Okay, great, wanna wrap up? Uh, just, yeah, quickly, um, I forgot what I was saying. Um, anyway, I, the self-esteem issue for me was the big issue. And I went away from the university ready to do the work that I was already doing, except in a different frame of mind. And uh, um, I, I actually had two kids in the kindergarten who are my star teachers right now, and they are already grandparents. So that I always talk about them, their sisters and they work hard and um, there are others coming up in the next generation because being 79 years old, I don't know how much time I got left, but I wanted to do what I could to leave tools 
for the next generation to carry on our work because you know time passes as we as we honored those people who had already passed from this program so that's in 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 a very oh and the other thing that i wanted to tell you was because of my self-esteem and because of some of the work i was doing I was nominated by two presidents of the United States of America to the, to the um, NACI, National Indian Education. I can't remember the full title. Anyway, it was a, it was a national title. Uh, 15 of us got selected up from all over the country. And I, it happened twice with me. Jimmy Carter did it, and then Pre President Obama did it. And I would not work for the last, last, last guy. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Daniel, we're going to come back to you for just uh, one or two minutes, a quick final word. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, you know, I um, went through a difficult year. Uh, I was there <clears throat> beginning of summer uh, and then ended up uh, a year later. But during that time, um, I got a divorce. Um, I almost dropped out of Harvard. And it just so happened that I brought my kids home from Brigham City, Utah. And uh, we were having a debate about me continuing to go to school. And my dad was adamant. And um, so we got into a little tussle. And I was picking myself up off the floor, an aunt of mine showed up that I had not seen for 20 years or so. And she says, I'll take the kids. You go back to school. And of course, the courts immediately, when I went and petitioned them to verify the divorce, the courts here in Hopi helped me right away. So I was able to continue and then to live in a dorm and that was a challenge there was no computer so nothing was quiet fortunately i was able to type near 80 words a minute when i left high school but there was a, a person next door to me who was a scientologist who studied quietly and so when my um, Typewriter was cracking away half the night. He'd be pounding on the wall, trying to get sleep and so forth. And when he was listening to his Scientology, whatever it is, I'd be pounding on his wall because I couldn't concentrate on what I was doing. And I was kind of not prepared for Harvard, except that I knew I had to read. So I read a lot i mean there wasn't a time where if there was any amount of time that i was having to do with schoolwork it was reading something and it's a good experience for me there was i was a teaching fellow i also was then selected as the uh, student cabinet representative for a year Although I attended two meetings, nothing seemed to be achieved or anything else like that. Um, so that was kind of a wasted effort. But at least I can say, oh yeah, I served on the Graduate School of Education, uh, a, cabinet, a student cabinet for one year. Uh, but that's all I can really say about that. We had a friend, uh, his name is Joe Abeda, and I would like to have seen him on this panel too, but he brought his family up and they're both from the same Pueblo, his wife, Donna and Joe. And Donna would cook traditional food. So I would go over to their house and that helped me an awful lot. Joe and I became very close friends. We would go to uh, baseball games together, basketball games together. Those were the things that, you know, I had fun about over there. And uh, I think that one of the things that I really uh, 
felt uh, thankful for was that after I graduated, several people that have passed away now have come to visit me in Albuquerque. So I remember from a different light rather than just being at, at Harvard. And so uh, to me, I never talked about Harvard so much in my own village. They don't care. They don't care if I went to, if I went to school. I had a place when I went into our religious uh, activity and I couldn't go beyond that until I learned the process. So it was very important, however, for me to believe that you should not lose your language. You should not forget the fact of your tribal history. That history is what pulled me through, through all the tribulations that I've gone through in economic development. I knew how our village was developed, where the water lines were, where the sewer lines were. So if anybody got in my way, I said, well, okay, I'll cut you off because your lines are going through my property, our property. Oh, well, we'll, well, we'll go ahead and we'll work with you. Of course you will. So by learning a lot about federal law, it also helped me tremendously. So your culture and your traditions, they come from the environment in which you live. As long as you live there, pay full attention to it. And thank you for having me on your program. I Great. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to definitely wrap up by 4.30. Thank you for those of you who are able to stay on. Uh, Della, I'm going to hand it over to you for just a quick one or two minutes, and then we'll pass it off to Shelly for some final announcements from Hunat before we all uh, wrap up today. Della, go for it. Well, I just want to say thank you for uh, bringing this anniversary uh, program together, and it's just wonderful to know that this program is still there for students for it's been there now for 50 years and it's just really uh, inspirational to see all of the young people coming out of the school and returning to their communities to make a difference and to uh, do whatever they can and appreciate all the work that they're doing to preserve the language and the culture and all the contributions that these Harvard graduates are doing and Bob, I'm certainly glad to see you uh, after all of these years and, and, and thank you for the good support you gave us when we were there, the encouragement and helping us uh, find our way through, you know, getting settled in and uh, all of, you know, the Harvard, Harvard life. And Wayne, I appreciate the work you're doing with your community. I've followed your career a little bit, so I'm really glad that, you know, you are keeping the language going. And Marie, it's good to meet you. I read about you and heard about you, and uh, thank you for your good work. And uh, thank all the people that tuned in to this program. And I wish our, like Dan, I wish uh, Joe could have been on this. He, you know, he's done a lot with his uh, Pro, his, his degree as well and um, like Dan has and Wayne and Maria and all the others that aren't on here so I'm just glad to be a part of all of this and glad that I made it through that first group and I wasn't one of the the a failure to this program that would have been against your record because now it's going on so thank you Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanna um, echo your words of gratitude, Della, for everyone who was able to be here with us today, um, especially uh, Della, Daniel, Wayne, and Marie for being on our panel. Uh, before we wrap up, I'm going to turn it over to Shelly from Hunet. Thank you, Kimmy. And thank you everybody for joining us today. A special thanks to Kimmy Yahweh for moderating our panel today. A special thanks to Wayne for starting us off with a prayer and helping us to remember those of our community who are no longer with us. 
Um, I want to give a special shout out to all of our panelists for your perseverance, for paving a way and paving a path for future generations to come to Harvard. It was great to hear your stories and to hear what it was like for you to be here at that time, but also to hear about you know, how strong you were and where you've gotten to in life now. I want to remind everybody that a recording of this event will be on the HUNAP YouTube page and that was posted in the chat box. And I also invite you to join us on April 5th at six o'clock Eastern time for a conversation and a reading with the US Poet Laureate Joy Harjo. And a special shout out to Bob Mathai for creating the program and for really planting a seed at Harvard for us that we hope that we can continue to grow into the future. Thank you everybody, have a wonderful day.